up, we have Paul Anderson, who is the Vice President of Chip Energy Incorporated in Goodfield, Illinois. And he will be telling us about different cook stove designs and options. Can you make this one larger? Don't, leave it. Don't, don't touch. No, <laughs> don't touch. We know better than to do that. This is technology. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here and uh, uh, talk to you about these different issues. I am involved with cooking stoves around the world, and by chance, or whatever it is, the stove that I deal with, the T-LUD stove, makes charcoal. And when biochar became a topic of things, I keep getting invited to talk to people about how can charcoal be made. Uh, you can burn it, you can do other things with it, but uh, uh, I've, let's see here, right thing. All right, and there's an abstract of the slides here are made so that when somebody else sees them later on, they will be able to go back through and see it, which otherwise they wouldn't necessarily see. So I will go very quickly over some of the slides. Other ones I'll spend a little bit more time on. I guess I'll focus more this way for pointing. In the, uh, the next slides, and there's several of them which I will then skip over, uh, to the pyrolysis and carbonization is two sides of the same coin. It's one thing. So you're going, and it's the only way that you're going to be able to make charcoal. The uh, origins of char, there's the regular fires, there's the retorts, there's the gasifiers. We'll talk a little bit about some of them. And there's probably always some other uh, chemical process that comes into them. When they say gasifiers, not all of them make char. Or, well, it, but some of them consume char. Some of them allow you to save the char easily. Some of them, it's with great difficulty that you save it. Do not assume that the name gasifier means, therefore, you are a char making. And the four, the four destinies of char, you can burn it. You can biochar into the soil. Unusable waste, uh, forest fire goes through. It's on the side of the tree. It's charcoal. You're not going to go out and get it. It's not uh, economically obtainable. And then there's other destinies where they could go into some chemical processing. So that is the content of the next five slides. And it goes into that, and I'm not going to spend the time on it, because if I did, I'm going to run out of time. But of these gasifiers, Few of them can make it small, and very few of them can, uh, uh, as stoves, and few of them make biochar. The tea luds are the ones that do that. Uh, did that one there. Very large devices. I am not going to be discussing them here. But the, uh, they are expensive, they're industrial, they're commercial, they're for profit. They always, as far as I know, uh, have other products, other purposes for it at that cost type of thing. Uh, fast pyrolysis is one of them that comes in, and the reaction times are, are very fast. There are, there's a paper, that I'll, the full reference to it, all biochars are not created equal. If you're not familiar with that paper, I definitely recommend it to you. Uh, it's about six years old now, or four or five years old now, and it has a lot of different things in to give you some background and stuff like that. Uh, the, um, um, let's see here, okay. I want to focus on affordable. Affordable is a relative term, and that's try to keep the cost down under $100. But how many of you are interested here in making char? You yourself want to make char. Keep them up here. One, two, okay, fine. How many of you are actively buying char from other places, and uh, you're needing sources and stuff like that? OK, we want to mix those people together so that the ones that are making it can supply to you and things like that. And uh, there are many different types of it in there. Size relates to affordable. If you want more of char and more output, uh, things will become, uh, uh, the cost will go up. Labor is also relative. And believe me, it is everything from <laughs> standing there the entire time to Start it, walk away from it, and only come back every couple hours or so to take a look at it. And that costs money. And that's the, the convenience will cost money in terms of affordable. Uh, fuels and raw materials are highly variable, and the major, there are major differences between purchased versus the self-produced chars. If you want to make it yourself, hey, it's a whole different ball game than if you're going to try to buy it out there on the market. The, uh, uh, options to consider, I have listed here. I will talk about all of them with pictures about them. 
So I won't go through the list right now, but they start from the smallest ones on up down to some of the, up, up at the bottom to some of the bigger ones. Small, as in cook stoves. And the Tilad stoves make biochar. There's different projects in Kenya and Costa Rica. The, um, uh, we struggle against traditional charcoal burning stoves because people go off and make charcoal the traditional old way, very destructive to forests and things like that. Some, oh, here's a source of bio, affordable biochar. You go to the hardware store and buy yourself a bag of charcoal. Don't buy Kingsford. I mean, it's a coal and other things. Buy the one that says original wood or stuff like that. It's going to cost you money. The all biochars are not created equal paper discusses those biochars also. The ones that you could the charcoal, whether it's a biochar or not, if you're going to use it, and don't think that they will necessarily be functional in the in the same way, okay? Uh, the, uh, um, okay, TLUD gasifiers can make biochar. It is not a retort. I'm thankful for the earlier speakers today pointing these types of differences out to you. Expect a 15 to 22% yield in biochar by weight. And the uh, uh, air, su air supply is the primary way to control the quality of it. And I've already talk talked with Stephen about how you can gain control over the temperatures of your char creations by controlling your air supply coming in, a bigger fan. Uh, uh, there's a ver variety of things, and I'm around here all the way to the end of the, you know, the evening tonight for you know, further discussions for somebody who wants something very specifically about them. And there's the reference for the all biochars are not created equal site and uh, that paper, but it's also, you can find it at my website, drtilud.com. I did not invent the TLUD method, I did name it, okay? And I've been on it for 12 years, so the, uh, uh, that's some of my, my involvement that goes along in with it. Uh, top lid updraft, TLUD, it's flaming pyrolysis, the migratory pyrolytic front moves downward. Let's get to some of the notes, uh, this is, you, I'm assuming you know this, and therefore you would be bored with hearing it again. If you don't know it, then we'll get back to you and we'll get you other types of things. But basically, fuel is in the center cylinder. You light it at the top. The pyrolytic front moves downward through it until it gets to the end of the raw fuel at the bottom, at which time the, the batch is over and you are to dump it out. Do not continue to burn the charcoal inside. It then is basically functioning as a forge. It will destroy the metal of the stove. These are basically uh, tin uh, or um, sheet metal stoves. We're trying to make them economical for people in third world countries. The, um, uh, but there's hours of discussions about the variations in this. All right, the smallest one that I'm, well, out in the display area in the, in the main room that we were at, I have a several of them set out, and one of them, which I didn't bring in picture, it is basically made out of uh, a tuna can and a slightly smaller diameter, I think it was a fruit cocktail or something like that, and my nine-year-old granddaughter punched holes through it with a hammer and an awl or like a nail and put it together, I helped her put it together the top, and it will work. So you can make them that small if you want to. Now, it's not going to give you enough biochar even probably for one plant uh, for your, in one pot. Next size up, and a very simple one here, the one, one G means one gallon. It's made out of two cans, as in the bird, the toucan bird. Okay, this is Hugh McLaughlin's uh, humor, okay? Wonderful. How many of you know Hugh McLaughlin? Okay, if you've met him, you won't forget him, okay? He's a great guy, he's out there in Massachusetts, and uh, he does uh, adsorption studies and things like that. So I definitely, uh, we can get you in touch with him, and he was the lead author on the all biochars uh, paper in it. The one of this, which I have in the display area over there, uh, it does need a little small chimney above it, which is another can of a type. This is made out of a a gallon paint can with its lip, and then this was a number 10 tin cut. He calls it a crown. All of the instructions on how to make this are on a website with pictures and stuff like that, how to go to do it. 
chances are. If you are just getting started, I recommend that you play with the small ones. Get to know how they function. When you want to get your bigger biochar uh, uh, quantities going, that's the time to move up to 55 gallon drums, which we're going to get to. But don't start with that. It's, uh, uh, when you do it wrong at that size, you, it takes a little time to uncorrect your, your errors, okay? The, uh, oops, went too far here. Uh, did I go back? Yes, okay. A stove called the Champion. I didn't bring one over with me, but this is a stainless steel one made in India. The pot sits up above. It's a tripod in through there. There's, a, again, uh, it's been purchasable, but it's a little bit difficult to find them nowadays. They're, they are available in India, but not over in the States so much anymore. A few sides on that. Here's a, an old picture of Pilod stoves back at a different time. Uh, this is the one from Chip Energy is a small, uh, I, I, I cannot go into these details. These stoves are of interest for the world um, uh, uh, poverty communities because they are very clean burning, low emissions. And this is a graph that then describes it into here. The carbon monoxide, no, sorry, the uh, uh, yes, carbon monoxide is on the red scale here. The blue scale is the particulate matter, charcoal stoves, very high carbon monoxide emissions, lower. So, and this is what we have for T-LUDs. So this is why, why they're out there. They are uh, of interest to us. Stove project that was done in uh, Uganda, and it was the predecessor to this stove here. What's shown there, and slightly different version up here, improving it, is the quad stove. Uh, quad because it's got four legs, okay? Nothing special about the name, but it gives you those characteristics. This stove will produce biochar for you at the rate of about 20% by weight, depending on what the fuel is that you're going to put inside of it. Um, it the price is now about $14 a stove. That's in Uganda. You want it delivered here in Illinois, I add on a portion of my round trip airfare because I bring it in my luggage. The, uh, uh, okay, another one. There is also rice hull uh, top lit updraft gasifiers, and they represent also the ones which have fans blowing in them. There's a, don't quite, yeah, this fan is right in here, you can't see that. That a forced air part gets on a, uh, uh, gives it special advantages. A man in Vietnam, uh, Paul Olivier, an American fellow in, uh, there, he's got write-ups in about it. We're trying to get these units out onto the market, but this is not a rice husk area. But evidently, some, some, some considerable success and interest in biochar from rice husks in the Vietnam area, something that should not be overlooked. Uh, not, er, not everything happens right here in the, the, the Midwest. The Finca stove is in a five gallon bucket at the bottom. And notice that it has a corrugated outside, this is simple roofing corrugation on it. Um, the variation on that by McLaughlin puts that corrugation on the inside, but I don't have a picture of it. It is a five gallon bucket with a corrugated metal inside and allows the secondary to come through. If you would like a five gallon bucket size, you're going to, you, you could use that. And it becomes very convenient for you and uh, very, very simple to make. Uh, help you with that separately. Uh, Awamu is the uh, a company that I work with in, in Uganda and they have a larger one. This is the, this is a, uh, that giant cooking pot is into here and the T-LUD is going to sit down below. This is the T-LUD chamber in there. It's in that same category like a five liter, sorry, a five gallon, 20 liter bucket. Now, this case here, we are using the heat for cooking. And if you therefore can pull it out and save your biochar, what did you pay for? Did you pay for your cooking or did you pay for the biochar? You get the double advantage of both of them. As we talk about bigger systems, lots of them just throw away the heat, and which is unfortunate, but this conference is about biochar. Get my 
clock here so I don't run late. OK. The, um, just one more example of how, many they, of, of how they can be done. Now, I'm up to the barrel size. In the room over there, I have about a 20-gallon, I think, uh, barrel. And I have also a, I think it's about a 30-gallon garbage pail. And they're all rusty, and they've, had, they've used them to make biochar. The biochar that I've made with those in my backyard in normal Illinois, and I've never had the fire department come by to give me any problems, but uh, always extremely careful to not end up with a big smoky event, OK? But I've made that biochar. How many of you here would like some biochar today? Nobody's takers? A couple takers? I got 40 pounds of biochar out there, and I'm not taking it home, all right? Uh, a highest bidder or best usage or whatever you want, but uh, it's in three bags and there's some stuff that's with that. I made this stuff. It's in my backyard and uh, uh, part of the stories that go with it. All of these websites and stuff, they're on the, uh, the slideshow, which will be re-put. Re uh, Nancy, how, how long will it take you guys to have this on the, on the web? A week, okay. You can go back, you can look at these, and they'll tell you all these different types of things and what's going on with it. Starting off with this one here, a large barrel, a 55-gallon drum in the year 2000 in India, a guy named Alex English, a Canadian fellow, and he made this one. It's the first one we know of as, a, as a, at that size. Here is his other one, which is six feet tall and 42 inches in diameter and didn't work all that well. So therefore, we're taking this as a good sign to don't try to scale up forever and ever type of thing. The problem is, in general, getting too wide and you're getting this pyrolytic front to come downward through it, it doesn't go uniformly and then it starts favoring and it finds an air channel coming up through the fuel and this type of things like that, and therefore it'll get down and pyrolyzing on the bottom, and you got some of the fire coming through in the thing, and you end up with a pocket of stuff which is not pyrolyzed, et cetera. I believe the 55-gallon drum, about, what is it, 22 inches in, in diameter, is about as big as it should be considered for going. But you can run multiple barrels, and that will keep you busy and will give you lots of char, okay? Uh, John Rogers, uh, there's a good YouTube about it, but I don't have a nice picture of it. He's got some things like what you'll see in the next couple pictures, but he is a, um, he has about four of these barrels that he runs simultaneously. And he's, he's lighting one and he's loading it up and he's doing it, and by the time he gets done with the fourth one, he goes, has a cup of coffee and he comes out and he empties the first one, and he empties the second one. He's made lots and lots of biochar. J.R. John Rogers. Watch for the name here, or how it comes along here. The J.R. Oven. And J.R. is sort of John Rogers, but it also stands for Jolly Roger. Okay? And this one here by Carl Frogner, and it's a, he has a gap in here. I'll mention that in a minute. It's up on blocks. His air is coming in underneath it. This is the chimney on it. It's a single wall device. It is extremely simple to make, OK? Now, the next one here, the Jolly Roger oven for Roger of Rogers. And Jolly Roger, as in pirates, we take from the excessive carbon dioxide of the atmosphere, and we bury it away as treasure in the soil. OK, folks. Take that any way you'd like to, but this is where it comes from. Another bit of human Laughlin humor, OK? So uh, in this particular one, which he did with Doug Clayton, the, down here is your barrel, and above it they placed a retort. And the retort then is putting the heat in from the outside because it's making it. Uh, this is not going to become a popular item. Picking up. A 55-gallon drum that has been filled with wood is tough, or climbing the ladder to fill it from the top, and then to take it down when it's hot, or otherwise, it's, it was a good experiment, but it, I don't recommending this for your backyard, okay? Keep it one barrel tall is what, is what you need to have, okay? 
Uh, Rechar is an operation. There's their website on it. And for $120, they will sell you this expanded steel and this lid and a few things. And I don't know if you even get the chimney with it. Uh, you don't need to go and buy that, but it's available. If you're the one that wants to buy the thing, you find it on their website. I think they still, they still sell it. They have a project in Kenya, and they're a USA-based operation. Uh, the bottomless biochar barrel. And I have several pictures of this, and this is the one that I am recommending for you to consider. Your bottomless means that when you pick it up, the, uh, uh, the char will remain in the hole. It's right down in here. So this, and this top over here, this was just cobbled together out of spare pieces found in Costa Rica. And the type of top, which, I mean, it can show you how it's done. But basically, it's a simple thing, and it captures. And these rods keep the top surface off of closing off the barrel. So the air can come up underneath, over the bar, and then it goes up the chimney and is running it as a T-LUD stove. The chimney gives you your forced draft. Or it gives you your draft, natural draft. You can also run it along, uh, find your spouse's hair dryer and use that, burn up a few of those. Uh, but my wife's not here to complain right now. <laughs> OK. In Kenya, this is the biochar barrel. This is, there's a little hole down, uh, there's a pit. And we it's very shallow. The primary air entrance, which can be closed off with a rock. Coming up here, we've got handles that we can put in through. There's the lid that sits over the, the top of it. And picking it up, we then end up with some biochar down in the ground. You talked about, let's make it in the field. If you're in a third world country with poor soils and you've got this there's uh, abundance of, of uh, agricultural waste there, and you had five of these barrels, and you went around, and you had two-man team, and they're doing it. By th they're just making char on the ground, and then they put, throw s soil over the top of it to extinguish it and stuff like that. Don't carry it anywhere. Now, if you're going to do it in America, your labor costs are a little bit different. But you can make it over a cement patio, or a, not cement, but a, uh, a, st a stone of arrangement there with an air duct that comes underneath it, a channel. You put your barrel over the top of it, light it. When you're done, you've got your char. You pull it off, you scrape it off, or you hose it down and things like that. Talk to me about that if you want to try to do something. I would love to have somebody uh, working on something like that. The next one, uh, I went to the uh, biochar summer school in Germany. And we had, uh, we had 10 and nine, 10 Stoves ignited at one time, all different uh, tea luds in there. And we ran this big one, this is the bottomless one, and we're picking it up with the bars, the same type of thing. And we just left our char sitting there on the ground. We made a lot more char in the one big barrel than we made in the other small one. This one out in California this last year, the, uh, uh, it's sitting on, we put it on a piece of corrugated roofing so that the air can come in underneath it. You've got to get the primary air in. It's the chimney and stuff. Again, just quickly put together a lid on it. Now, we intentionally picked it up slowly. Take the picture, take the picture. We raised that up, and we created a chimney effect of all that hot stuff. That's why we have so many sparks and stuff coming out of there. This is not the way you would normally do it. It says over here, put a lid on it or just take it and tip it over easily. This prevent, you do not have to pick up a barrel and dump out hot char into some other container when you're using the bottomless method. Okay? So the, um, this is the, what I think should be or could be well utilized in a variety of ways. Uh, irregular walled one, I'm not recommending. It's awkward. Did this in my backyard, putting that around. I'm running out of time here. Okay? The, um, but it made char. Some of that char is probably what's in those bags over there. Oops, wrong button. Uh, major issues and challenges, fuel supply. The diameters give you un, uh, irregular airflow. Relatively small amounts of biochars if you want farm size quantities. Uh, and uh, labor, it can be labor intensive, time consuming. Financial review on it, I'm not going to go over that. It was nicely done before. The, uh, we can come back to that. Other uses, CHAB, combined heat and biochar. 
If you can get some other purpose for it, your biochar is home free. And one of those is the chip energy dragon and the furnace. The dragon is, or the furnace will make a, uh, will heat water into here for a hydronic water a heating system. You're saving using the heat. And then you get the biochar coming out. This is the one without that heat exchanger on it. It's on a pallet. We've made a few of those things. The price tag currently sits at $15,000. And you can make your own biochar. It's the, the quantities are um, on one of the other things. But it's, it runs with pellets. It runs with other different types of fuels. The, uh, it's more about that uh, chip energy thing. There's a sheet over there on it for you. And how it comes in. You saw that graph in the earlier uh, talk. What is different? This is, this is the AVOD. TLUD, the, you dump out the char afterwards. The AVOD, you're removing the charcoal from the bottom. So the gases that are created never go up through the charcoal that's been created. In a TLUD, it goes through the charcoal. And we're thinking that blocks off some of the adsorption capabilities, redepositions and things that, that go along with it. And uh, uh, the bigger system that uh, Chip Energy has, Cacao dryer in Costa Rica. This is a dairy. It's now in operation. It was in construction. These are big vats for pasteurizing or making milk and ready for cheese and stuff. They're using a TLUD technology in the sort of the barrel size. And their fuel is papyrus reeds. Moses would be proud of them. Okay? The, uh, the barrel size, there's a whole talk that I've given about that. The, OK, here's the plug. And Nancy, can we make sure that when we have our closing remarks that everybody from the other section also gets told about this? This is in October 13th to the 16th out in Amherst, Massachusetts. This is the North American Biochar Conference. It's three days of what you've got today, folks, and sort of on steroids type of stuff. And there's going to be an extra day or perhaps two days on the Thursday, Friday of live fires and demonstrations and stuff. I'll be there doing stuff that we can't do at this, this meeting in here. But, uh, and that's it. Yes, so uh, uh, any questions? Yep. <laughs>